Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending. My name is Tim Hurley. I'm with GPT. We're going to be doing a series of talks. They're going to be called Tim Talks. They're going to be about FIKs and MIJs, flange isolation kits and monolithic isolation joints, and how they're used to fight corrosion. We did a paper called In Defense of the Monolithic Isolation Joint. It was done and in 2017 at NACE, it was presented. It was presented uh, because there were some issues with MIJs, uh, but we felt that the MIJ issues had been solved and we wanted to let the world know that they had been solved. The ideal monolithic isolation joint, or MIJ, is easy to install. It's simply welded on both ends. It's placed in, in the pipeline and hopefully it's there for many decades. The ideal MIJ has traceability, it also matches the pipeline metallurgy, the pipeline bore, and the wall thickness. You don't want a gap, you don't want a drop in your pipeline. If you do, you've got some turbulence, which is possibly going to create some cavitation and possibly erode the pipeline or part of the MIJ. You also want that MIJ to last 20 plus years, ideally. Unfortunately, that's not always what you would have received. In 2014, in San Antonio, Chevron put forth a paper. It was entitled, Monolithic Isolation Joints, a Possible Weak Link in Pipeline Integrity. The paper had great facts, great pictures, and it went through and showed a number of issues with MIJs at the time. Uh, they presented it uh, at NACE. It was well attended, the, the room was full. They listed five things that could be a problem. They said chemical attack might be an issue. And they had pictures of the material within the MIJ being attacked. And one of the things that Chevron really said was a problem was that these were monolithic. They were a solid block of metal and you couldn't see inside. So you had no idea really what was inside. You had to take the manufacturer's word what was inside that metal. That material could be exposed to the media and if it was the wrong media, you would get chemical attack. They also found hard heat weld areas. And if, you're, if you have a hard heat weld, um, if your weld is over 250 on the Vickers scale, you can get sulfide stress corrosion. And nobody wants the product that's supposed to stop corrosion to corrode, so that would be a problem. They also find there was improper compression of the elastomer and the GRE. So there were some design issues there. The manufacturers of the MIJs didn't take into account the volume of the, the seal and the groove size. So it ended up crushing the GRE and or the elastomers. They had a problem with uh, isolation sheet, the GRE. GRE is a permeable material and it kind of relates to topic one. So if you have the wrong chemical and it's able to permeate into the body of the GRE, that's going to cause problems with the MIJ. And then finally, they found that there were problems with the actual design of some of the MIJs. That was kind of goes hand in hand with the um, third point, the proper compression of the elastomers. They didn't allow enough space in the groove and the seals were crushed. In 2014, all of that was true. Um, there was no doubting it. They had all the facts, the figures, the images. And a personal story, GPT was ready that day to present the ElectroStop, our new MIJ. So you can imagine when we heard that this presentation was going to be called MIJ is a weak link in your pipeline, the same day we were going to introduce our line of MIJs. So we took our MIJ and hid it under our table, under a cloth, and decided not to launch the product. And we waited a half year to launch that product. We thought, you know what, this, this presentation doesn't sound good for MIJs, but it also teaches us. And it was really a, a, an awakening, I think, for not only users of MIJs, but probably for manufacturers as well. I know for us, it certainly was. So we decided to take a look at competitive MIJs. We bought nine different manufacturers' MIJs and we cut them all apart. And what did we find? We found almost exactly what Chevron said we would find. We found different coating types uh, on different joints made by the same people, which is scary. The coatings on MIJs, that's your first line of defense. And coating specifications are extremely important. Anybody that's been involved in coating specifications, if you go to a NACE show, coating 
take up about half the booths at a, at a corrosion show. So coating is very, very important for corrosion prevention. If they've got different coatings and they aren't supposed to be different coatings, that's going to be an issue. We also found GRE impinging in the media stream. So we saw media that could have hit about a quarter of an inch of GRE on the inside of that pipeline. That's going to cause turbulence. It's going to wear the GRE down. It's going to end up being a problem. Remember, these things are supposed to last 20 to 30 years. So you don't want that to happen. At GPT, we're used to manufacturing gaskets at the same bore size as the pipe, so there's no issue there for us. We all, they also found when we cut the joints apart that the welds were too close to the non-metallic parts. This, is, this goes back to the design issues that Chevron said they found sometimes. So the weld was too close to the non-metallic parts and the weld is going to be hot, right? and it's going to go many times over the temperature of those non-metallic pieces. If those non-metallic pieces are over-cured, it's going to have a problem sometime down the road, if not immediately. We also found, um, again, this goes back to monolithic. It's a solid block of material. You can't see inside. And we purchased some joints that were supposed to have two seals on the inside. When we cut them apart, we saw one seal. So I think the manufacturer thought, well, they're never going to look inside. It'll save us some money if we put one seal versus two seals. So they just put one seal in. So that could be a very big problem. We also saw improper welds on smaller joints. On two inch, um, one and a half, one inch joints, those smaller joints, you don't want a fillet weld. If you have a fillet weld, you can have potential for pinpoint leakage in that area immediately. So if you did a pneumatic test or hydrostatic test, you'd probably find some leakage in those pinpoint uh, weld areas. We also found exactly what Chevron said we would find in regards to the elastomers. The elastomers were overcured, And I think a lot of people think that the overcuring would probably come from the welding because welding is a very hot operation. So you would expect that some of that welding is going, the temperature is going to be translated to that non-metallic area and burn up the rubber. That does happen for sure if, you, if it's not designed properly. But if it's designed properly, you still could have a problem. Where would you have a problem? The coating. And I don't think a lot of people think about the coating. So the coating has to be cured. And a lot of coatings on um, MIJs have to be cured at 400 degrees or higher. Well, if the elastomer is only rated at 250 degrees Fahrenheit and you're curing at 400 degrees Fahrenheit, you can already see there's going to be a problem. The maximum temperature recommendations, if you've got nitrile, you can't go over 250 degrees Fahrenheit. If you've got EPDM, you don't want to go over 300 degrees Fahrenheit. If you've got fluorelastomer or um, FKM, then you can go much higher. You can go to 400 degrees for Viton. Uh, for CalRes, FKM, you can go to 500 degrees Fahrenheit. And any good manufacturer is going to have a way to monitor their, their temperatures during the operation. If you've got aromatic or aliphatic hydrocarbons, if you have steam or water or amines, you're going to, at the very least, want a GB, a GL, or a GF type Viton or an EPT type Viton. Those are the only ones that are going to be chemically compatible. If you use a standard Viton, I think a lot of people believe that Viton is just a very chemically resistant material for everything. It's not the case. You have to use the right type of Viton. It's even more true when you start getting into really nasty chemicals like hydrogen sulfide. So hydrogen sulfide, uh, HNBr, or hydrogenated nitrile, it's a really chemically resistant product, but when you get H2S at high concentrations, over 1,000 ppm, it's, it's going to be chemically attacked. So that's going to be a problem. You have to use Viton, Aflas, or CalRes. The glass transition temperature also plays a big part in the manufacture and use of MIJs. Why? Glass transition is where a solid material turns to a rubbery or a semi-solid. You don't want anything inside your MIJ turning into a semi-solid, trust me. You've got the joint loaded under pressure, you weld it in place, so the joint is welded under pressure. If the elastomer or the GRE are turned to a semi-solid, in this case it'd probably be the GRE, you could lose some of that initial load that you have, you could have gaps in your MIJ on the inside, which could then ultimately lead to leakage. TG is very important to understand when it comes to GRE materials. This is another thing where it was good that Chevron did that report because right after they did the report, 
GPT started working with their supplier, who's an exclusive supplier for GRE, and developed G400. G400's T sub G, or glass transition value, is over 400 degrees Fahrenheit. So everything in the joint, the, the seal's 400 degrees, the GRE's 400 degrees, so you're not going to have to worry about thermal attack. You also have liquid epoxy inside the joint. And here are some things that people don't often think of. It's a little bit of an insight. So we have to pump epoxy into the body of the joint to give it some structure. They pump it in as a liquid and it's supposed to turn into a solid. That epoxy has to have a high temperature rating. It has to have a good dielectric value, probably 550 uh, volts per mil or better. And it's gotta have a low viscosity, better than 1,000 centipoise. 1,000 centipoise is about the viscosity of water. And you want this material to be like water because you don't want any bubbles or voids on the inside. If it's a thick material, when you pump it in, you could end up with voids, which is going to be a problem if you're trying to block out electricity. The coating has to be an abrasion-resistant coating. Remember, that's your first line of defense. So you want that to be very abrasion resistant. There's ASTM tests that can be done for abrasion resistance. There's also ASTM testing that can be done for despondment. You wanna make sure that when you adhere that coating to the joint, it stays on the joint. It's gotta be chemically resistant uh, because remember, you're not just coating the outside of the joint, you're coating the inside as well most often. And that inside of the joint is going to see the media. You want a low cure temperature. You don't want 400 degrees or higher cure temperature. If you have a high cure temperature, you're going to hurt the GRE or the elastomer. You want to avoid powder coat and thermal cured epoxies. Why? Because those typically have high cure temperatures. Weld qualification specimens. You want to make sure that the welds are qualified. You're going to want to do NDE testing, non-destructive testing. You're going to want to do bend testing on the joint. That joint has to be as strong or stronger than the pipe it's attached to. You want every confidence in that product. You want nick break testing. You want to make sure that when you do welding, that there is no porosity, there are no voids in the weld. You want tensile testing done to make sure that the welds are strong. You want Vickers hardness survey done to make sure, again, that your, your number is below 250. Product testing. At GPT, we test every single MIJ before it goes out the door. I fully recommend, if you're purchasing MIJs, that every single joint be tested. Don't allow batch testing. If you're putting in an MIJ in a pipeline, you're putting it in because the, the pipeline is critical to you. You want something that's going to last for many decades. If you do batch testing, you know that one joint of many is going to work for sure. The rest are a question mark, and nobody wants that. So have every single joint tested. Do electrical testing, 25 mega ohms at 1,000 volts DC. Do breakdown voltage testing, 5,000 volts DC at 60 hertz for a minute. Do hydrostatic and pneumatic testing. Hydrostatic testing, typically one and a half times the operating pressure. Pneumatic testing, 87 PSI for 10 minutes is, is the norm for us. Have coating thickness testing done. Make sure the coating's not too thin. Again, it's your first line of defense. You want some, some substance there. Also, you don't want a super thin coating because then you could have a potential holiday. You don't want the coating too thick because then it could crack. When you have coating that's too, too thick, you end up with a mud-like state that can have some cracking when it cures. It also can have an orange peel type effect if it's too thick. You want to do NDE on the welds. You're going to want to do a mag particle test. A mag particle test does the surface. You're going to do ultrasonic testing to make sure that there's no porosity inside the body of that weld. The paper that GPT did uh, in defense of the MIJ is more than just an argument that, hey, you know what? Things have changed with MIJs. MIJs can now be better as long as you make sure that the manu manufacturer does the right things. It also has a tool built into it. There's an MIJ supplier assessment survey. So we strongly recommend that if you're purchasing an MIJ, if you're specking in an MIJ, that you visit the manufacturer of the, ma the monolithic isolation joint. When you go there, you can utilize this tool. This tool is simply a checklist, and it makes the visit very smooth, very quick, but very complete at the same time.
It's going to check all the areas such as design. It's going to check raw materials for traceability, for flow. It's going to check manufacturing for quality, for calibration, for traceability. You're going to be checking their quality procedures to make sure that they're an ISO 9001 facility. You'll want to make sure that they've got inspection protocols and test plans that are in place. And then testing, you're going to want to make sure that they test every joint so that you're 100% guaranteed that the joint that you purchase is going to work when you put it in the field. If you want to download the paper uh, in defense of the MIJ to get that assessment survey, there's a link. You can go to www.gptindustries.com. Our final recommendation, like I said, personally visit the, the manufacturer. Uh, ideally, uh, bring a team that is knowledgeable on sourcing, on welding, on manufacturing and quality control. Utilize the supplier assessment survey. It's simple to do, it's free, so it makes sense to use it. Insist on high quality goods, manufacturing and their testing capabilities. If you do all of that, the results will be that you won't have the weak link in the pipeline. You're going to have the most reliable piece in your pipeline and it will be your MIJ. Again, everyone, thank you for your time and attention. We really appreciate it. Let's get corrosion before it gets us.